Well, good morning, Zion City. So glad to see you today. Excited that you are here today. And obviously, for those of you here at the Flowing Wells campus, um, today might look a little bit different. And there's a couple reasons for that. First of all, uh, today is a day where I'm actually ministering in a church on the East Coast, a church that uh, I am a part of the oversight of, and the pastor is on sabbatical, so they invited me to come. And, uh, and thanks to the miracles of technology, uh, we are able through video to continue to, to convey the message. We're going to jump right into the series in a few moments of 1 Corinthians again, uh, but I, I thought it would be a great opportunity through, through video to be able to share with you the message today and uh, that your hearts would be encouraged and that we would continue to grow and really dig into this message of 1 Corinthians. And so um, for those of you specifically that are in the 1130 service, um, this sort of helps you get a preview of the end of August, what's going to happen as we transition into preaching live at the Oro Valley campus. And so uh, for that season. And so uh, for everyone that's here, thank you so much for being here today. Excited uh, for what God is going to do. I hope that you're ready to receive from the Lord today. Somebody say Amen. And so we're excited for what God is going to do. And so would you just join me with me right now in welcoming all of our campuses in this morning. Come on, put your hands together and welcome them in Oro Valley, in the South Campus, Espanol. Listen, wherever you might be watching, we're so glad that you're with us. If you're in one of the correctional facilities, we love you. We're glad that you're here with us today. I, I want to just encourage you this morning to get your Bible out and go with me to the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. Come on, let me see your Bibles. If you have your Bibles, come on, wave them around. Listen, that's right, everybody puts their phone up. That's fantastic. And so we are a part of the technology revolution around here and uh, doing amazing things. 1 Corinthians, we're going to begin today uh, in chapter 3. And today my assignment uh, is to complete literally two chapters. We're going to go through chapter 3 and chapter 4. So uh, I want you just to, to kind of buckle your spiritual seatbelt. I want you to get ready because uh, it, it's going to be a lot today. But I think it's such a powerful message for us today. Uh, I heard a story of uh, three members of a church who had gathered together in their group. And um, they had gotten together and, and they decided in this group that they were really going to go deep. That they were really going to be transparent. They were going to be honest with each other and share their deepest, darkest struggles and sin. And so as the three of them began to get together and talk, uh, they, they, they started, the first, the first member of the group started by saying, well, I need to confess to you that, you know, I've got a real struggle with alcohol and uh, I, I'm finding myself more and more given and it's overtaking my life and I'm functioning, but I'm finding myself becoming dependent and I'm really struggling with, with alcohol. And then the next person, the next guy in the group sort of begins to speak up and because of the honesty and transparency, you know, he decides he's going to go for it. And so he says, well, I've kind of been struggling with some lustful thoughts and some, you know, just some struggling with that issue in my life, an area of my life. And, you know, I'm really trying, I'm really believing God. And finally it came to the third member of the group and the third member of the group says, well, my, my struggle is gossip and I can't wait to get out of here. And I think that is sometimes what church feels like is like, am I really supposed to trust these people? And what, there are all kinds of people. I don't know if you know this or not, but there are all kinds of people, all different levels of spiritual journey that are represented in this room right now. The truth is that there are some, as we've talked about, there are some perhaps who would say, I don't even believe you know, in Jesus. I'm just, I'm just exploring and trying to understand. I believe in God, but I'm not sure what I believe. There are some who've recently come to Christ. There are some of you who, who've been saved for so long. I mean, you were here when the ark was here. You were here. You've been here for forever. And, and the reality is church is filled with broken people. Church is filled with challenging people. Church is filled with all kinds of people, all of us, on a spiritual journey together. And, and that's what, as we look at 1 Corinthians, what we see, Paul is writing a letter in response to problems in the church. We've been talking about division. We've been talking about all kinds of issues, the, the struggle of wisdom you know, in the culture versus the, the message of the cross of Jesus, the power of the cross of Jesus. And so as we've been, as we've been wrestling with all of this today, as we come to chapter three, uh, Paul does something very interesting. He describes literally three kinds of people that are present in the church. And so actually, if you've got your Bibles, go with me to, to chapter two, verse 14. Now, let me just say this, because in, in terms of how the scriptures are broken up, 
Um, the scriptures are inspired, but I would say to you that, you know, translations and, and even scripture breaks aren't necessarily inspired by God. And what I mean by that is sometimes I'm, I'm thankful for the scripture breaks. I'm, I'm thankful for the numbering system. Mostly that was done in the Bible to enable you and I to study the Bible in an, in an environment like this. Because if I didn't have chapter and verse, how hard would it be for you to find where we're talking about today? And so translations, much the same, they're given to help us understand the Bible. And so I think this is one of those instances where probably the chapter break really doesn't follow the nature of the letter that Paul is writing. And so go back to verse 14. It says the natural person, somebody say natural person. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. What's he saying? He says there's a, there's a certain kind of people that he would call the natural people. Um, the, 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 the word that is used for the natural person is the psychios, the, the person who is the psychology. We get words like that, the people in their mind. He says they, they do not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their folly and their foolishness. And they're not able to understand them because those things are only understood, Paul says, as you spiritually discern them. That's why there are some people, even here in the natural, in the flesh, who say, well, I don't, I don't get it. This doesn't make any sense to me. Like, I don't, what's this Jesus and the cross, and what does that even matter to me, and why is the Bible relevant? Paul describes you in the Bible. He says, there's people that this doesn't make any sense to them. And he goes on, though, and he continues. He talks about another kind of person. He says, there's also the spiritual person who judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. Now, this doesn't mean if you're spiritual, you know, you're holier than thou and nobody can judge you. It simply means this, that if you are a spiritually minded person, and he describes exactly what a spiritually minded person is like, but if you're spiritually minded, he's saying this, you have an insight into things, you can evaluate things based off your spiritual mind, and, and the fact is, people who don't have a spiritual mind, because they don't understand that, can't really evaluate you. So does that make sense? So what, what he's saying is this, is there are people who don't, don't get it, and they can't really help you, evaluate you in your Christian journey, because they don't understand it. But for you, because you have a spiritual mind, let me explain to you what I mean by this. He goes on and says this, the spiritual person judges all things, but himself is judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord as to instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. And so Paul writes and says, spiritual people, here's how you can identify really spiritual people. Not because they carry their Bible, not because they show up to church, not because they tithe, not because they don't cuss or chew or go with girls that do, they, not because of all, the, all that outward facades. Though, some of those things will change for the spiritual person. The way that you recognize them is that they have the mind of Christ. The way they think is submitted to the mind of Christ. So we have the natural, the, 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 the unknowing person spiritually, the spiritual person who has the mind of Christ. And then Paul talks about a third group of people that I'm really going to focus the majority of my attention on today because I think it is the majority, forgive me, I'm not judging, but I think it is the majority of the, the capital C church around the world. And it's the next group of people that Paul talks to. He says, but brothers, uh, he said, I could not address you, chapter three, verse one, I could not address you as spiritual people. I can't talk to you like you're spiritual people because you don't have the mind of Christ on these issues. Remember, we talked about before, they were, they were choosing their favorite pastor. They were, they were, you know, they were mad because he wasn't there in person. They, they had all kinds of little issues. He was preaching from a video and they didn't like it. Come on, somebody, right? And all those things were happening, and they were getting upset, and they were secondary issues that really were not important as it relates to the real message of the cross and the power of the cross. So remember, these were people who were dividing because of leaders they liked. And so he says, I can't talk to you. I really wanted to talk to you like you were spiritual people. The problem is, is you, you didn't have the mind of Christ on these things. You, you were fighting, and not because they just disagreed, but, but they were fighting against each other and creating division and choosing leaders and tearing the church apart. He says, I wanted to talk to you, he says, as spiritual people, but as people of, you were as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. You're, you're like people of the flesh. Now, this is different. He uses a different word than the psychikos. It's interesting. The spiritual person was called the pneumaticos. Pneumatic, pneuma. It's where we get our word for Holy Spirit, the pneuma, the breath of God. He's saying, 
The spiritual people have the mind of Christ and they are being led by the spirit of God. The natural people, they don't have, they don't have a spiritual bone in their body. They don't understand it. They're not, they're, and listen, that's not a judgment. That's just saying this is where they are. Paul is calling them all into, into this place of spiritually minded mind of Christ people. But he's saying this is where you are. But there's another group of people that are, he uses the word sar- sarkinos, which is the word flesh, and it literally means this. It has to do with the idea of being a carnal or a fleshly Christian. You know, there's some people who believe there's really only two categories. There's some people who say, well, you're either a Christian or you're not. You're either a, a, a follower of Jesus or you're not. You're either, you're saved or you're not. And while I would agree with that on some level, I will also challenge that idea because Paul addresses a third group of people that, that literally I would say it this way, they have enough of Christ to be saved, but they still have enough of the world to be miserable. Are you hearing me? They have enough of Christ in their life. Like I've, I've prayed the prayer, I've accepted Jesus, I believe pastor. And we look in scripture and understand that salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ. It's a gift of God, the grace of God through faith. And so your salvation is not the point of question. Your salvation is not, you know, well, well you didn't mean it. And there are some who would argue these points and we won't, we won't spend time this morning. But the truth is this, understand. He says there are some of you who are, your growth has been stunted as though you are infants. The word that he uses when he talks about infants literally means you are an adult, but you are behaving otherwise. Come on, have you ever met an adult who didn't behave like an adult? And Paul is addressing them spiritually and saying, you're, you're supposed to be, I really wish you were spiritually mature. I really wish you were ready for me to really give you the the, the, the meat of this word, but the problem is, is there's this spiritual, there's this stunted growth in your life, and he begins to describe to them the, the whole process of how this happened. He says, you, you've not quite come to the place of, of growth and understanding. It's interesting as I was thinking about this, how, how do you know if somebody is mature in their relationship with the Lord? Well, we talked about spiritual people have the mind of Christ, And natural people don't even think about, you know, God or how God wants it done. So how do you know that you're maturing? Anybody interested? Everybody loves self-evaluations. Come on, you love all these personality tests. You love all, right? I just, I want to know how awesome I am. Let me take the test. Well, actually, Paul in Hebrews gives us a test that we can use. Uh, It's in chapter 5 and verse 13. He says, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. So again, this, this, this picture that Paul is, is talking about, this, this sort of infancy in Christ, he, he's, not, he's not talking about people who just came to Christ. Listen, if you've just recently come to Jesus, Paul's not talking about you in the sense of, 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 of that you're just, you know, you're just a little baby in Jesus. No, what he's saying is this, there are some of you, you might be an infant in Christ, and it might be the rightful place that you are, because you just came to Christ, and you really don't know much, and you're like, I don't know. So the, the message for you is, I'm going to show you how Paul tells us to grow. But Paul is actually talking to people who should know better. As a matter of fact, all throughout this chapter of Corinthians, he says things like, like, like that, that phrase to them. By now, you should know. By now, you should understand. Like Paul is like again and again going, I'm telling you this, but you should already really have this revelation and have this nailed down. And he writes in Hebrews and he says this, he, he says, everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. This is why we're taking time to go through the Bible, you know, sort of chapter by chapter, verse by verse, if you will, on some level, is because part of what my heart is not just to teach you the Bible, but teach you how to read your Bible, how to study your Bible, how to understand what are some of the skills that I need to be effective. Because he says you become, you, mature people are skilled in the word of righteousness. They have a grasp. One of the greatest ways to get skilled with the word of God is, is to be consistently engaged in it, familiar with it, learning it. You, listen, I don't know everything about the Bible. I don't know where every verse is. I don't know, but I will tell you this, the more time I engage with God's word, the more skilled you will become because it gets in your spirit, it gets in your heart. And this is the thing I love when you add the word and the spirit together because the Holy Spirit says this, when you have need, and you need answers, 
I will supply those answers to you. And what I love is many times he brings the word of God up in those moments to be an answer for the problem that I'm facing. So instead of operating in my natural mind, the mind of Christ and the leading of the Spirit helps me to respond to situations the way that a mature believer following Christ responds. And so he goes on in Hebrews and he says this. He says, he says, they are, since since he is a child, but solid food is for the mature. For those who have their powers of discernment, Some of y'all didn't know you had a superpower, the power of discernment, right? It sounds like a superpower, but he's your ability to discern things trained by constant practice by distinguishing to distinguish the good from evil. This is it. Maturity is based off of this. It's not based off how much of the Bible you know. It's not based off how much church you attend. Maturity is not chronological. Well, I've been saved for 47 years. Well, good for you. That's awesome. Maturity is simply based on what Paul says is the ability to be trained in discerning right from wrong and doing the right thing. So maturity is connected, adulthood is connected, and it goes back to the word that he uses to talk about them being infants. He's saying you're behaving in a way that an adult shouldn't behave. You haven't discerned. You you haven't either figured out what's right or wrong, or if you have figured out what's right or wrong, you are choosing wrong. And can I tell you, isn't it so easy to choose wrong? (laughs) It is so easy at times to let my flesh, my carnal, the the spiritually stunted part of me lead Waylon rather than letting the Spirit of God lead me. It's so easy for me to respond in a way that's contrary perhaps to the way the Holy Spirit would have me to respond. You see, when he talks about these infant these stunted growth, these what he would call carnal Christians. He's talking about those whose, whose immature lives, they, they, it, they are constantly grasping onto the present perspective of what's going on around them and making decisions out of present perspective. There are so many people right now, based in the climate and the culture of our world today, are looking around and they are making decisions based what's happening in, in the economy based on what's happening in politics, based on what's happening in the world today. And he says people who do that are, are, are stunted. They are infants. They're not ready because adults don't, are not limited by the immediate circumstance and perspective they can see beyond it. See, every one of my kids, at some point in their life, they wanted something now right? They, they wanted, they wanted it now. I want another, I want dessert first. I want, you know, there was all kinds of things. And based off of their limited perspective, it wasn't that they didn't want it or they did, they were just immature. And so they're like, I want it now. And maturity steps in and says, no, 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 wait, wait. Another perspective is if I give you, you know, a, a whole carton of, of ice cream before dinner, it's not going to be good. For you or me, because your mom's going to find out, right? It's not going to be good. This is not, this is not healthy. And so perspective is important. You see, these people were saved but stunted. And truthfully, what Paul begins to talk to them about is you need to grow up and you need to mature. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, you need to grow up. Come on, say, look at your other neighbor, the one you don't like as much and really that you mean that you need to grow up, right? You need to grow up. Paul addresses them and says, the problems that you're facing in the church, listen closely, the problems you're facing in the church, they're connected with this carnal Christian, this immaturity, that if you'll address this, you'll be able to address any of these issues yourself. You won't need me to write letters. You'll be able to address them as spiritually minded, mind of Christ people, and you can respond in a way that builds the kingdom of God. So the question becomes this, so how do we grow? How is it that Paul begins to describe? So interesting, so interesting where he takes this passage because for us, most of us today, we say, well, you know, if you're gonna grow, you know, you should probably read your Bible, you know, you should probably pray, you should probably go online and take some kind of theological course, you know, you should probably get some kind of degree. And we would go the route, again, that Greek influence of information. We would go the route of saying, you just, you need more information. If you had more information, you'd grow. But that's not what causes growth. I want you to look what Paul begins to talk about. I thought this was so amazing. And probably one of some, what I'm about to read to you are some of the most misused, you've even misused them, 
misused scriptures in all of the New Testament. Some of the most missed, misappropriated, misused, and a lot of it is because of our Western, you know, American mindset. And, and we, we misuse these scriptures constantly. I've even misused them, to be honest with you. I know some of you are looking at me like I'm, I'm full of heresy right now. But just, let's, let's, let's go through this. He, he says, I, I fed you with milk, not solid food, if you're not ready. And even now you're not ready, you're still of the flesh. Why? For there's still jealousy. He's looking at their behavior. Strife amongst you. You're not, you're, are, he said, are you not of, of the flesh and behaving only as the, in the human way? For when one says, look what he talks about, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Apollos. Are you not merely being humans? Aren't you being the naturally minded person? What is Apollos and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned each of them. I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the growth. So neither is he who plants nor is he who waters anything. So I want you to understand something that, that is Paul he begins to describe in this next portion of scripture, he, what he really is describing in terms of growth is, are you ready? It is the church. Th- this is where he goes. You're mature, you're fighting, you're tearing each other apart. Let me talk to you about the church now and the purpose of the church. Because keep in mind, these people <clears throat> that we are, that we are you know, fortunate enough to have the scriptures as believers, they didn't have a Bible to turn to and say, hey, what did Paul say in 1 Corinthians chapter three? What was he, what did he say? They didn't have that available to them. And so their primary way of growth and the primary function that we see of growth throughout the New Testament that was written for us is through relationship in faith community, in biblical community with each other. Because I'm going to tell you, the next two chapters, the the rest of three and four, all he talks about is the church and the leadership of the church. He's like, you're immature, you ought to be grown by now, you're fighting, you're quarreling, and here's how I can tell because of your behavior, and I'm going to tell you who you are and how God has designed this and how God leans leadership into it so that you can grow in your faith. You see, we have begun to take the church as sort of a peripheral well, you know, it's, it's a nice addendum. You've even heard people say, I love God, I don't need the church. But I'm going to tell you that person is not reading the same New Testament that I'm teaching out of because everybody in the church was in the church. There was nobody in this book who's like, yeah, I'm all about Jesus, I'm, not hang- I'm just not hanging out with these people. Because relationship, it's interesting because he, when he talks about the one in Hebrews who is trained, this word trained is where we get our word for gymnasium. He's, you go to the gym. You go to the gym because there are unique things at the gym. Now I know some of you, you know, you run outside, you work out at home. You go to a place to be trained. And if you, if you really want to be trained well, the truth is you get with somebody else who can train you. Are y'all seeing this? This is the word that Paul used when he talks about people who are trained to, to be spiritually mature. They, they get trained. They go to, he literally, Paul says, they go to the gym. Now, I'm not saying all of you need to, you know, go up your, re-up your gym membership. I know it's June and everybody's canceled them by now. But what I'm saying is he likens this maturity journey to being trained through relationship and connection and community that how we grow is really by being in relationship with other believers. Because it's in our relationships, listen closely, it's in our relationships that all of this knowledge that we get, all of this truth, all of this revelation gets a chance to be worked out. So to have truth without relationship means you have knowledge without without really execution or the ability to use that information. And if you never use it, the problem is it, it never becomes real in your life. And so Paul begins to talk about the church. I want, you to, I want to give you some perspectives on the church. He talks about church and church leaders. There are some interesting things he says about how the church is built. He begins to talk about the roles of Apollos and, and himself. And he says, we're nothing. We're, we're, we're nothing. He actually goes on to describe their role as being that of servants. And we'll get there in a minute. But what he says is this. You all are fighting over people. And the reality is, it is only God who gives increase in your life. 
And God has chosen, yes, he's chosen to use these people because they're, he goes on and talks about being master builders and he talks about them being gardeners and all of these spiritual fathers and all these things we talk about. And he says, they're, they're all of these things. Yes, they have a role. He goes even farther to say, and they will receive payment for what they do. Not, not talking about you know, financial payment in the earth sense, even though that's not inappropriate. It's, it's in the Bible as well. But he's talking about there's a reward that will come based off of how they build and what they do. And so I want to I want to help you just sort of capture, and for the sake of time, just sort of paraphrase through this, uh, as it were, what what kind of church? How should a church really be built? And what I see in the scripture, the first thing Paul talks about is he says this: the church is not built on a person. He says the church is not built on the personality of the preacher, the personality or the or 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 built on the the giftings of a person. The church. The danger that we have in our culture is churches are built around people, around gifted people. Listen, one of the things I'm glad for at Zion City is we don't build this church around Wayland or Dana Sears. I have a role, I have gifts, I have purpose, but it's not built around me. It's not built on me. And, and the reality is, Paul says this, it's not built on me, it's not built on Apollos, it's not built on Cephas, it's not built on us. The truth is, they have a role to play. Well, what is their role? Well, if you have your Bibles, I want you to go over to Ephesians chapter four, and he talks about them as apostles, and I wanna just take a few moments and, and dig into what is the role, what is my role? If, if I have a role here as your pastor, um, what is my role, what, it, what is it I'm supposed to be doing? Is my job to you know, just get up and preach? Is my job to do the ministry? Is my job to marry you and bury you and everything in between? Is that my job? Well, thankfully, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, um, Paul again, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, begins to pin and the job description of pastors. And here's what he says. He said, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the pastors, or the teachers. So who is the he? Well, if you'll back up a little bit in the scripture, you'll find out that the he is Jesus. So the Holy Spirit gives gifts to believers. We'll, we'll read about that later on in Corinthians. So every believer who is here, when you came to Christ, I believe the Holy Spirit gives you spiritual gifts that you need to discover, you need to sharpen, you need to go to next, you need to figure it out and find a place to begin to use your gifting and, and build the kingdom of God and, and fulfill your own call, your own purpose in, in the kingdom of God. But the Spirit gives gifts to believers, but to the church, Jesus, who is in charge of the church, he gives the church what we would call the fivefold office or the apostles, the prophets, the pastors, the teachers, and the evangelists. Not necessarily in that order, but you get it. And so understand there are these offices that Jesus places within the church. So some of those are we're familiar with. Some of them, we, we understand the term of pastor. We understand the term of teacher. Uh, we understand perhaps the term of evangelist. Sometimes we're a little, little iffy about a prophet or an apostle. And let me just say this to you. If, if that word bothers you, apostle or prophet, then just put an ick on the end and just say apostolic or prophetic. And instead of talking about a person, we're talking about a gift and a mantle and a calling. But, but I want you to see what our job description is. The same thing he says about himself and Apollos and Cephas, he says this. He says, their job is to equip the saints for work of ministry. D did you catch that? What he said, my job is, is to equip you for the work of the ministry. So according to scripture, Pastor Whalen and the pastoral staff is not even really supposed to do ministry. We're supposed to equip you to do ministry. Now, what's so powerful about this is this word equip is a medical term. And this medical term equip literally means to set <laughs> the broken bone. So, so what that means is part of what my role is in preaching through Corinthians is to help you figure out perhaps where there are some, some broken bones, some dislocated shoulders, there are some things out of joint, there are some broken places of understanding or broken places of obedience and come along and help you to set the bone. Now, setting the bone can be a painful process. So I've heard. I've never broken any bone in my life. Thank you, Jesus. Don't intend to. But the reality is, is that setting a bone can be a, a difficult process. But when you set a bone, what I understand 
is that once a bone is set, it will become strong and in some cases even become stronger than it was before. And so part of the role of, of the office is the people that God places in the church, and I think every one of us have some degree of these sort of at work within us. We're called to pastor and love people, care for people. It may not be your full-time vocation. It may not be your job, but you're a sent one. God wants to use you in the prophetic gifts. But hear this, that it's, a, it's not just about doing ministry and holding events and having services. No, 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 no. My job is to equip you to actually do the ministry of the kingdom of God. Now, look what the result is going to be, because this is what's amazing. He, he says this, that for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity, there's that unity again, and faith of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood. So, so we're supposed to come to a place of growing up. Again, just reinforcement, the church is what matures us. Now, it's not information, honestly, it's the use, the, the revelation, using information, relationally connecting, whether it's evangelizing and sharing the gospel, whether it's discipling and pastoring, caring for somebody, whether it's, you know, being prophetic, whether it's being apostolic, it's, it's through those venues that we begin to mature and grow in our faith to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. So we're, we've got an aim, we're, we're, we're to the fullness of Christ. So that we may no longer, here it is again, be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Paul says this, children are easily influenced by every new wave that comes in. Every new fad of how ministry and churches are doing things, children will be easily influenced back and forth. Mature people, know how to stand against the fad of the day and be mature. Because their foundation, as you're gonna find out in a few moments, is not, not found in what's happening, their foundation is in Jesus. He, says, he goes on and says this. He says, they will be carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, mature people speak the truth in love. We're to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ from whom the whole body, fitly joined together, held together, every joint which it is equipped, which each part is working properly, makes the body grow, that, the bo that, that it builds itself up in love. So the fact that we are doing the ministry, equipping you for ministry, you're doing ministry, I hope you're getting this. This is why next is so valuable and important if you have not done it or if you have done it and you've done nothing with it. Because there's many people who've gone through the process but they've like, okay, now I know, and I'm doing nothing. Listen, now that you know, you become more responsible to do something with it. And so this is why it's so important, because this is about your spiritual maturity. You, I'm not just rallying you to get involved in the church. No, I'm calling you to be equipped and grow up and, and be mature and be developed in your relationship with God and do it through relationship with other people. Because through relationship, you're gonna get a chance to forgive and you're gonna get a chance to, to overlook and let love cover a multitude of sins. And through relationship, you're gonna get a chance to correct. And through relationship, you're gonna get a chance to, 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 to stand in righteousness and believe in faith and intercede and stand together and agree together. All of those only come through relationship of the church that Paul is describing in Corinthians saying you need to grow up and God's given you the perfect instrument to develop you it's the church Paul goes on and says we go back to Corinthians Paul goes on and says in chapter 3 verses 11 he says it's not built on a man but actually the foundation of the church is Jesus Christ I understand that that the church is not built on a man but Jesus is in fact the foundation of the church he goes on and says the church is built with with the idea of community, not as individuals. I want you to get your Bibles and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16, because this is one of the most misused portions of Scripture, misunderstood, I think, in the church today. It's in verse 16. He's just gotten done talking about how we build the church. Jesus is sort of particular about how we build a church. He says, there's some things you'll build with that are nothing but wood, hay, and stubble. And how you'll know <coughs> if something is wood, hay, and stubble is when pressure and fire comes, it will be burnt up. It won't last. It'll be here today and gone tomorrow. All of us can probably think back to 
you know, things that were going on in the church that no longer exist. And chances are those things were probably wood, hay, and stubble. He also says there's another, there's another you know, silver, gold and silver and precious jewels. He says you're going to build with that. And the fire will still come, but they'll remain. What happens when you build with the right, with the right concept, when you build with the right truths, when you build with the word of God, when you build with that which is righteous and holy, that which is godly, when you build that way, when fire comes, it actually purifies it and makes it better. Are y'all getting that? So fire will come, persecution, difficulty, challenge. How you're gonna know what you're building, what you're made of, is do you get better through challenges or do you disappear? Do you, do you get even more valuable? Does your faith become more valuable through fire or does it just burn up and go away and you're nowhere left to be seen? And so he talks about how we build, but he is really talking, I need to say this, because he's really talking about the church. He's not talking about individuals. And this is where we misused it, because we use words like I, me, mine, and those words are nowhere found in scripture. Those words are replaced by we, us, and our. And listen to what he says in in verse 16. Do you not know, again, here it is, don't you know, you should know, Listen, if I could sit to Zion City, every campus and location, you, you should know this. You, you've heard this before. This is nothing new. Don't you know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Now, here's where it's misused. We think this is about me personally, individually, and it's not. Do you have the spirit of God in you? Yes, because the Bible says that, that you've been given the spirit of the Holy Spirit. As a believer, you've been given the deposit of the Holy Spirit that seals you until the day of Judgment until the day of salvation. And so the reality is this, is you've been given the Holy Spirit, but you alone are not the temple of the Holy Spirit. What Paul, is, actually he literally says when he says you, it is a, it is a use of the, word, of the a plurality of the word you. He's literally saying all of you gather together. What he's saying is the church is the temple of God and the Holy Spirit dwells in you. If there were ever an argument as to why church in person is valuable, Paul just made it. You know, listen, if Paul had video, he'd use video, I promise you. Paul would use any means possible to carry the gospel anywhere it could have went, I promise you. Because Paul used letters, that was, the, that was the medium of the day, that was the communication tool of the day, Paul used them, right? And we have them in scripture today. But I'm gonna tell you, Paul addresses something, he says, when you, as followers of Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, get together, you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells there. There is something of the manifest presence of God that only happens when we gather. Listen, I'm not condemning anybody who's making a choice for physical health or you're on vacation. That's the beauty of the resource of online, but it's not a replacement. Because you alone, this is where we've mis- misinterpreted it, you alone are not the, the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you. You alone are not. It's not what the scripture, it's not what Paul had in mind. His whole context is the church, the church, the church, the leaders of the church, the church, the church, the church. And then all of a sudden in the midst of it, he says, don't you know? Because why? They were in a city in Corinth that had 36 different, different pagan worship sites. He's like, you're the place where the spirit of God shows up. You are the only place where the spirit of God shows up in Corinth. Don't you know that when you get together, as these spirit-filled believers, it's this play on the Old Testament view of the, of the temple. You're the place where the presence of God can be felt. You're the place where the spirit of God resides. You, when you get together, God says, I love the church. I'm gonna show up where the church is, where the church will honor me and welcome me. That's why we don't just get together to be with each other. We get together to be with each other and with him because you are the temple of God. We are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells with us. It, 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 it replaces where we've lost value of the church. We've made the church of just this, eh, whatever, leave, leave it or take it. You can be a Christian without the church. And I'm not saying you can't surrender to Jesus without the church, but I'm going to tell you the minute you surrender to him, he's going to want you in a church. 
He's going to want you with other believers. I don't care what it looks like. It could be big. It could be small. It could be, you know, it could be prophetic. It can be, I don't care how, how it looks like. That's between you and the Holy Spirit to figure that out. But I'm going to tell you, the moment you start following him, if you're really following him, he says, now I want you to grow. And the way you grow is through relationship and community with other believers, other people of faith. He says, it's not about individuals. The church is built on and led from a position of servanthood. So Paul describes, he's talking about leaders, and I gotta hurry, but he, he's talking about leaders. And, he, and, and here's what I want you to understand about servanthood. Uh, I need to clarify a few thoughts about servanthood. Servanthood is the only model and nature of leadership found in the Bible. It's the only one. So if you aspire um, to to leadership in a church, or you, you aspire to ministry, there's one model. There's only one model found in all of the scripture in it's servanthood. Jesus says, if you wanna be great, literally Jesus, I believe this, if you wanna be great, he says, I don't have a problem with you wanting to be great. Some people think, well, he doesn't even want you to be great. No, he said it. If you wanna be great, I don't have a problem with that. What I have a problem with is how you try to be great. If you try to be great like the world is great and lording your power over everybody, that's not the way to be great. The way to be great is by becoming a servant. So Jesus actually equated leadership with servanthood and said, if you wanna be a great leader, be a great servant. Now, for some people, this idea, where, where do I get this? Well, I want you to go look at, look, we're gonna skip down a little bit for the sake of time because Paul then talks about you're the, you're the temple of God, it's the church, the spirit of God, he, he, says, he says, you know, don't be deceived by the wisdom. He talks about wisdom again. He actually says this. He says, whether Paul or Apollo, Cephas or the world, life or death, which were sort of these two poles that he put out, life or death, you know, he does, he does it in Romans. Again, height nor width. And what he's literally saying is, from here to here and everything in between. From Paul to Cephas, like those are polar opposite, boom, and everything in between. Here's what he says about it. If you read on, he says, all of those things... He says, they are yours, the present or the future. They are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ is God's. Here's what I believe Paul is saying in this moment. He's saying, you are squabbling over individual leaders, and the truth is, they all are yours. They all have value for you. So you take the portion, whether you like their style or not is not really relevant. You take the value, the gifting that God has placed in them for you, you receive it, you let it have its effect in your life, you walk it out in community, you grow, it's for you. But ultimately understand, they, as well as you, belong to Christ who belongs to God. So turn your eyes off of people and turn your eyes onto the one who gives all the gifts, not the gifts. Amen? And so then he begins to talk about the leadership of the church and servanthood. He says, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. L literally what Paul says is this, the church is built on servant. We are servants. It's interesting, the picture that, that Paul often uses the word for servant, if you've studied, is the word doulos. Maybe you've heard that. But this is not the word he uses. The word doulos as a servant is not the word. He, he uses a different word, and the word that he uses describes the manager, the servant manager of a Roman household. And so this is why I think we have to understand servanthood. Because servants, some people think that servanthood is, is just an ab, you know, abdication of all leadership. Well, I'm just a servant, you know, just whatever you guys decide. I'm just, I'm just here to serve. So you can't be a leader and be a servant. Well, Jesus contradicts that idea. So some people think that being a servant means you can't make any decision, you can't lead anywhere, you can't, you can't have an opinion, I'm just here to serve. That, that's not the word that Paul used. Paul says, you need, we are servants. We are the, the masters of the household, but we are under the responsibility of our master. I have complete authority. Think about Joseph. I have complete authority over all of the happenings of the household. I'm here to lead, but I am under submission to, there is one greater than me. It's exactly how the church is designed to work, is that as a leader, I... I, I have been given authority, I've been given responsibility, I've been given a calling, I've been given the gifts, but there is somebody greater than me that I have to answer to. I'm just the steward. Paul says, we're just servants. Literally the word means, uh, a translation, another translation of the word means to be the under-Roman. The under-Roman, what does that mean? You think about these, these incredibly, again, it's a harbor, it's where these ships are coming in. 
And the worst job on the boat was the under Roman because he was the guy under the, 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 the bottom of the ship and responsible for responding and rowing in complete unison to move the ship where it needed to go. Not a very thankful job, not an enjoyable job. It's not a sea cruise that you get to see the beauty of the sun. No, no, you are underneath the deck of the ship rowing. That's exactly how Paul describes ministry and leadership in the church. I laugh because sometimes there are people who look at leadership in the church and think, oh, I, psh, I could do that. That looks like fun. You get up and talk to people for, you know, an hour on a week and, and then you go play golf and you get to, you know, everybody thinks you're awesome. And, I'm, and Paul just says, you need, the way he describes it is you are a servant. Now, what's interesting is most of the people in the Corinthian church were either slaves or what we would call freemen, which means they had been a slave, but they had, been, they had bought their freedom at some point. So they completely understood what Paul is saying. We're servants. We're stewards. We're, we're, not, we're not bosses. We're not masters. We, we have a boss ourselves, as a matter of fact. Now, we, we have authority. We're, we're not everybody's errand boy. We don't abdicate leadership, but we have responsibility to our master to lead and to be in charge and care for what God has entrusted us. See, I, I love the next phrase that Paul goes into. Let's, let's read on together. He says, moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found, full, found faithful. Let, let me tell you, this is, a, this is a life verse for me. Because what, what Paul clearly says is this, the number one quality that you look for in leadership is faithfulness. The num- not giftedness. See, in our world, we look for giftedness. Oh, they're awesome. Oh, they're smart. Oh, they're talented. Oh, they're gifted. Oh, they can sing. Oh, they can play. Paul says, no, no, no. The number one requirement of every servant, every leader in the church is they're faithful. They just keep showing up. (laughs) I think about it. This this next month in July will be 18 years of just showing up. We just keep showing up. Every Sunday, every every week, every Wednesday, we just, just keep showing up. Faithfulness is not only desired, it is a necessity in the leadership of the church. Faithfulness. He goes on and says that it's required that you be found faithful. But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. For I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not, I am not thereby acquitted. So Paul is saying this, um, I'm not judged by you. Um, <laughs> I'm your servant, but you're not my judge. Now watch this. This is going to get good. Right, turn to your neighbors, that's gonna get good. All right, you should say gooder, because it's already been good. Okay, but, but he says this, I, I'm, 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 I am a servant, but I'm not judged for you. I really don't even care, Paul goes on to say, I really don't even care what you think about me. Like some of you are like, woo, man, Paul, he's, he's getting a little saucy, right. He says, he says I am there, my not acquitted. He says, I don't know that I've done anything wrong, really. Um, but again, at the same time, I really don't, I don't really know, and so that's up to God to judge that and decide that, and, I'm not being, I'm not, Paul's saying, I'm not saying I've done everything right. I don't know that I've done everything wrong, but I will tell you there will come a day where I will be judged. Therefore, he goes on and says, he says, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not, I'm not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. You know, I always laugh because people say, well, well, God, only God will judge me. Right? You ever heard that? And I'm like, that's the one I'm afraid of, actually. (laughs) Only God can judge me. And I'm like, yeah, that's the one I'm concerned about. I'm not, really, I'm not really concerned what everybody else judges because they have no power over my soul in eternity. I'm more so concerned about God who does judge me. Yeah, that's the one I'm concerned about. Only God judges me. Well, yeah, that's the one I'm worried about. That's the one I'm focused on, right? He said, it's only the Lord who judges me. And he says, therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes. Some of y'all need to hear this. Don't prejudge it. Here, here's what I want to understand about Paul, what he's saying. Paul says, I belong to you, but actually I'm not accountable to you. I'm accountable to the Lord. Now I know there's some people like, wait, 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 you know, Pastor. Listen, no, I think Paul had accountability. There were other disciples that, that he, he worked with, submitted himself. There, a lack of accountability is not what he's talking about. But what he's saying is, I'm not, I'm not leading this Corinthian church from this perspective to please you and make you happy. I'm leading you to make him happy. But I am, I belong to you. See, as leadership, what he calls us to in the church, the church that's built on, the, on servanthood, 
we are called to belong to each other. I belong to you as your pastor. I, I'm here to serve you. My heart is to serve you. But it's a little bit, the best description I could probably give you is being a parent. If you've ever been a parent, you understand this. Because the moment you have that child, everything becomes about serving that child. But that child is not in charge of you, or at least some of you. <laughs> we're gonna have a, a, a raising your kids seminar in the middle of summer, you should come to it. Right, no, we're not. But the reality is this, no, hear me again. Everything I do, the moment that child is born is to serve the well-being of that child. Your whole life shifts in that moment, like, oh man, now I'm responsible for somebody besides me, and I have to, you know, I can't just stay out all night, and I gotta make enough money to feed them, and I gotta change diapers, and I gotta, I gotta do all the things, you, I gotta have a house, a place to live. And so your whole life becomes about serving them, but they're not in charge of you. Good parenting says, nope, that's where it stops, I am the parent, you are the child, which is exactly the, the language that Paul begins to use in Corinthians. Wait a minute, I am a spiritual father to you. And even though he talks about how we're nothing and we're just servants, at some point he shifts gears and goes, but I am a spiritual father to you. God did use me in your life to help you grow and to come to Christ. And so he, he uses that, but understand, Paul says to them, he says, I don't judge things. Don't judge things before it's time. It is so easy, one of the most mindless, easy things to do in the world today is to become a critic. It takes no intelligence to be a critic. It takes no, it takes, it takes no skill to be a critic. It takes, it takes no real gifting to be a critic. Can I tell you, there is no such thing as a spiritual gift of criticism. And Paul is talking to people because they are criticizing Paul. They are criticizing, oh, Paul just brings milk. He doesn't bring meat like the, like the philosophers of our city. Oh, Paul, he's weak. He's weak when he shows. And they're just picking him. It takes nothing to be a critic. Paul addresses it, and he says, listen, here's the problem. You are prejudging before it's time. It takes no skill to be a critic, but isn't it one of the easiest things to do is become a critic? <laughs> I, I, I laugh because we live in a world where, where, where there's a whole segment of our, of our online, I mean, I've just described to you social media. It's all just about being the critic. And it takes no skill to tear somebody down. It takes no skill to point out a problem. It takes no skill. It really, it takes nothing. And, and what I have found in my life is that, number one, a critical eye will become a habit. Once you allow yourself to become the critic, you will believe yourself to be the, criti the critic in all things and become deceived. The other thing I've learned about this critic that Paul talks about them criticizing and judging, he says this, he, he talks about them, he says, he says, don't pronounce a judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things that are now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. He, he says, God is going to judge this stuff. He doesn't need you to prejudge it. He'll take care of it. And there are some things that you think are amazing that God doesn't. And there are some things you think are awful that God thinks are amazing. And he says, when he shows up, he will be the righteous judge. He doesn't need a critic to help inform him of how he needs to decide about a situation. You see, it has been my experience that, that people who are busy, busy criticizing are rarely busy doing anything else. People who spend their life criticizing are rarely actually doing anything because it's easy to become a critic. And Paul addresses this. Now, these next number of verses, just for the sake of time, I encourage you to read them because Paul then begins to talk about himself as an apostle and, and Apollos as an apostle and, and the role in life. And, and basically, Paul kind of kicks into a sarcastic sort of overtone response to them. Oh, you are all, you're so rich, we're so poor. You're so great, we're so horrible. He literally, I mean, I kind of appreciate that about Paul. He has a spiritual gift of sarcasm, which probably that's not a spiritual gift, but, but he's using this approach to get their attention. And I wanna draw your attention as we close to, to verse 14, as he talks about them as apostles. He says, when reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become, listen to what Paul, how he describes himself. We have become and are still like the scum of the world 
and the refuse of all things. It's not that Paul has a, a, a low self-esteem, it's that Paul is saying, we, we've, we're willing to become less in people's eyes if it means the kingdom of God becomes more. I'll be wronged, I'll be, I'll be accused, I'll be attacked, I'll, that's okay. I don't need to respond to all of that because truthfully what Paul is addressing is criticism is a part of leadership. If you don't ever wanna be criticized, don't ever aspire to lead anything. Because the moment you lead something, there will be critics. You've heard the saying, it's, you can never please everyone. And so it just becomes a part of it. It's not something you enjoy. It's just a part of it. It's just a part of leadership. And Paul addresses that, and he, he, he says this. He, he goes on in verse 14, and he talks about all of this intense conversation, and then he gets to the, what I believe is the crux of the entire chapter. He says, I do not write these things to make you ashamed. He says, I'm not trying to bring shame and guilt and condemnation to you. He says, but I admonish you as my beloved children, for though you have... For though you have countless guides in Christ, you have all kinds of people that are yours, that are Christ, that are God's. You have all kinds of people. You do not have many fathers. Paul brings them back to the place of remembrance to say, I was there when you came to Christ. I was there when you received. I was there when you were introduced. Matter of fact, I was a part of introducing you as a spiritual father. And here's what he says to them. He says, for I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel, and I urge you then, be imitators of me. You know, I've spent a lot of time talking about the church and leadership, and and probably some are thinking, you know, pastor, it seems more appropriate that you should probably come sit out here and listen to yourself. And, and, And trust me, you can never preach a message without preaching to yourself first. Because I'm the guy that has to spend hours and hours and hours wrestling through with the Holy Spirit and him talking to me before he ever talks to you. But here's the thing I want you to understand. Paul says this, I've been talking to leaders, I've been talking to all of you, 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 the church, the leaders, and now I want to bring you all into this conversation by saying simply this, everything you've heard me say about us, be imitators of me. Just follow me. That's a pretty strong statement. To to say to people who are spiritual leaders, hey, follow me, just do what I do. Follow my example. But that's exactly what Paul says. It's exactly what Jesus said. He, He called us to follow his example, but he also called us to be the kind of people that people can follow, our example. You see, in in this picture of fathering and parenthood, he says, I've I've been a servant, I belong to you. I'm here to serve you, but I'm here to please the Lord. That's why at Zion City, one of the passions we have is doing ministry not to please people, but to please the Lord. When we worship, it's to minister to him, not to you. But here's the beauty. When you minister to the Lord, here's the thing I love. When we minister to the Lord, who cares more about you than anybody else? Who knows what you need more than anybody else? Because as we focus our attention on him, he is then free by his presence, because we are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells with us, by his presence to minister to your specific need as you are here today. He goes on and says this in verse 20 and 21, and I close up with this. He says, for the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. Remember, he's been wrestling with these philosophers, people who are articulate, and they they know how to talk. Boy, they they know how to talk. And Paul says, I just gotta remind you of this one thing. The kingdom of God is not about all of this, this talk. It's not about all this articulation. It's not about being eloquent. It's about power. This word power is interesting because it literally means this. I wrote it down. It is a supernatural influence that changes your reality. The kingdom of God is not about talk. The kingdom of God is about a supernatural influence that changes my reality. It's about the spirit of God coming into our church, coming into my life in such a powerful way that my reality is changed. My behavior changes. My circumstance changes. My faith increases. My my mouth gets quiet. Come on, somebody. My criticism goes away. It's about a supernatural power that comes into my life. And because it comes into my life and it comes into our church, it changes our reality. Paul says this. It's not about talk. It's about a supernatural influence that changes reality. It's what we talk about in transforming culture. It's a supernatural influence that changes 
reality. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Paul is talking to carnal believers and he says to them, remaining worldly is not an option. The Holy Spirit is calling us to develop, to train, to sharpen, to skill through the constant practice to be able to distinguish good from evil, to, to, to grow in our discernment, to grow in our relationship. I believe this, that part of what the Holy Spirit's doing in this season is leading us into a deeper biblical community that he wants us to grow and mature. My question for you today is simply this, where do you need to grow? Do you take a moment and just ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Would you invite him not just talk, but power. Would you invite him to show up and to bring his influence in such a way that it will change your reality, that it will change your heart, that he'll help you, that he'll, I'm not saying we do it on our own, that we just respond in these areas by our own will. Listen, it's not about self-will, it's about the Holy Spirit coming in and ministering to us. And maybe you're here today and, and you're not in biblical community, I wanna encourage you, allow the Holy Spirit to lead you. He will always lead you into community and away from isolation. Allow the Holy Spirit to draw you into, into a, a spiritual biblical community to build, to build and grow you. Maybe there's some of you today who've, who've never accepted Christ. Maybe you're that natural man who would say, you know, on the surface, this doesn't make sense to me, but today something of the Holy Spirit is drawing me. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, just simply this, I'm going to ask you, if that's you today and you say, you know what, Pastor, I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I want to become that spiritual man. I want to become the one who has the mind of Christ that surrenders and sells out to Jesus and follows him with all of my life. Or, or maybe you're that person who's here and, and you're that, that in-between carnal Christian that says, I've, I've got enough of Jesus, but I've got, a, I got a lot of the world and that world part's making me miserable. Listen, he's here today to change your reality in a supernatural way. So if you wanna accept Jesus Christ today, I just wanna invite you to do this with me. We're gonna pray together. And if that's you this morning, say, I wanna accept Jesus. Would you just do this for me? Would you just lift your hand? Say, pray for me, Pastor. I wanna surrender my heart to Jesus. I wanna give my life to him today. Thank you so much. Just lift your hand. Say, that's me. That's me. I, I realize I may not be in the room, but the reality is he's in the room. And that's what really matters is he sees your response of faith today. And he will meet you at your point of faith today. That's me. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. Thank you so much. You can put your hand down. We're going to pray together and receive Jesus. We're all going to pray just to encourage you, but just pray this simple prayer. Jesus, today, I invite you to bring your supernatural power into my life and change my reality. I believe you died for me, that you paid for my sin, so I can be forgiven, I can be made a new creation, and I can serve you, Jesus. In your name I pray. And everybody said amen. Come on, can you put your hands together today and celebrate them, all that God's doing as your campus pastor comes. God bless you. So excited for what God's doing. I love the question that he...